Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this very special evening of student presentations and special presentation and song presentation from the Technology and Future of Medicine course, Lab MP590. Um, I'm very pleased to see so many of you here. Um, and I, I think we'll probably have lots of opportunity to discuss many things in the course of the evening. Those of you who haven't taken the course yet, I, I hope it gives you a good impression of what that will be like. Um, and uh, for, for those who have, have taken the course previously, I, I think it may give you an idea of some of the progress that we've made. I, I hope I am in a general feeling that we are uh, uh, exponentially <laughs> progressing in the, in the course, just like the world outside us is. Um, so I think that to um, keep us on time, uh, we'll begin with a first student presentation. Victor Choi is going to tell us about the impact of technologically mediated communication on the quality of our relationships. Victor, take it away. Thank you, Dr. Solis. All right, so my name is Victor, and I'm talking to you about uh, digital technology and our relationships today. Let's begin. So as we know, technology has transformed and will continue to change the way we live. We have digital technology that keeps us updated and connected. We have reliable energy that keeps us warm, transportation networks uh, that keeps us traveling to different places and visiting our loved ones, as well as robotic surgeries that save lives. So when we look at it, the average person today lives more comfortably than it came a few centuries ago. Now, the interesting thing is, we're not happier. Subjective reports of um, happiness have shown that we have not increased our happiness since the 1950s, over 60 years ago. And on the graph over here, you can see that our income, our average income has increased, our standards of living have increased, the number of goods, the amount of goods that we've consumed have also doubled, um, but our happiness have not increased. Now, one may ask, why? Jean-Jacques Rousseau, um, famous Enlightenment philosopher, has made this argument that might provide some answers, and he said, through habitual use, the conveniences afforded by technological progress had lost almost all their pleasurableness, degenerating into genuine needs, and the deprivation of them became much more painful than the possession of them was pleasing. People were unhappy in losing them without being happy in possessing them. Now, he made this argument at 1754, the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. And this argument still holds true today if we think about it. For instance, traffic jams. We're unhappy sitting in our cars, stuck in traffic. But yet, when the cars are taken away from us, we can't go to work anymore, we can't go to grocery shops, um, and we, get, we can't get to anywhere, especially in Edmonton. How about computer processing speeds? We always. We always compare about, I mean, we always complain how our computers are slow. Yet, if computers are taken away from us, we can't go on the internet. We can't do our work. We can't go on social media to connect with others. So, as you can see, the very process of technological, technological advancement create new needs and desires that become integrated into our everyday life. And I'm particularly interested in how these new needs, how these new, need, new desires change our lives. Specifically, I wanted to look at digital technology, how digital technology affects how we interact with others, and in turn, how does it affect our relationships, and whether these changes are good or bad to the quality of our relationships. So at first glance, it seems like it does a little bit of both. We have text messaging, it's great, it's efficient. We can communicate um, in you know, 160 letters, including spaces, it's in real time, instantaneous. Yet, this also occurs in inappropriate times, in classes, in meetings, even in funerals. Now, digital technology has 
came up with a whole new language. As we all know, there, these, these abbreviations are how we communicate in online communication very often nowadays. But this also happens. Let me translate that for you. I speak text. So you can see communication gaps can occur uh, between generations because of digital technology. Now, it doesn't necessarily have to apply just to different generations. It applies to myself, too, when I'm talking to friends um, at my own age. The other day, I was just talking to this girl, and don't, uh, don't ask me how this came up, but uh, she used the term BBG. So I don't know what that means. And apparently, it means baby girl. So I learned that <laughs> right, right off the bat. All right. Let's continue. OK, so can, digital technology enables us to connect with those people uh, who are geographically isolated from us. We can maintain our relationships through distance, etc. But however, this also occurs. The very same thing that keeps us connected is the same thing that prohibits us from paying full attention to the person that we truly care about. OK. How about some other examples? Let's dig a little deeper. <clears throat> Before social media or digital technology came along, um, we carry out conversations in person with physical interactions with other people in coffee shops, in pubs, in clubs. Nowadays, most of us interact with each other through technological mediums, such as social media, instant messaging, SMS, etc. And this is a good one. So before digital technology, we mark the birthdays of people who we care about on our calendars to remind us we have to plan the special event for this person. But nowadays, we depend on notifications to remind us when are those you know, memorable days, birthdays, etc. <clears throat> so in effect, we can see that something is lost when we communicate through digital mediums. But exactly what is lost? And this is where we can go. So I wanted to look at three communicative virtues that we all value in our relationships. Patience, honesty, and empathy. Now, these are three communicative virtues we, we, we value greatly in our relationships. Think of the last time someone wasn't being very patient in your interaction, or someone wasn't being honest or empathetic. Patience can be defined as a virtue that involves taking the time to listen and understand each other. Honesty, the willingness to be authentic in our interaction with others. And empathy, the capacity for sharing our feelings of joy and suffering with others and for others. So to begin, I would just like to look at why are these virtues important in building positive and strong interpersonal relationships. So we'll start with patience. <clears throat> Patients build trust and openness by letting others expressing their opinions fully before you interrupt. The patient person is able to grasp the hidden meaning behind words and understand a joke. A patient person can support someone who is telling a difficult story. It conveys the commitment one has towards the relationship by telling the other person silently that your interest in them does not end when they can no longer entertain you. It bridges and smoothens opposing, uh, op opposing opinions and misunderstandings, and it strengthens our tolerance and appreciation for each other. So how does digital technology, which includes social media, play a role, and how does it affect our patients? So we know that the, in a physical conversation, patience is often expected because it would be rude to walk off an unfinished conversation. So therefore, the physicality of a face-to-face -face conversation provides a training arena for building patience. 
but how about social media? <clears throat> Unfortunately, it seems that there are more escape routes for practicing patience than there are opportunities that exist in practicing patience in social media. Take, for instance, online chats. <clears throat> The burden that exists from leaving a conventional conversation unfinished don't really apply in online chats. When we become bored to, uh, to a conversation, we can end it with a GTG, TTYL, got to go, talk to you later. When we, become, when we become bored with a friend's profile, we can quickly switch to the next one in hopes that the content that is displayed will momentarily amuse us. And we're always constantly trying to multitask. So no one has the time to look at that box that says user is typing. And if we think about it, we never do, right? We either go on to another conversation, go on other websites, go play a game, go downstairs and grab a bite, etc. And consequently, we now depend on notifications that reminds us that our friends have replied, and we should get back to them. And there's also an increasing trend towards short images, I mean, short and simple messages. We have a tweet, a poke, a text message, limited to 160 characters, including spaces. So it seems that patience is undermined through communicating through digital meetings. How about honesty? But let's start with why honesty is important in our relationships first. Honesty enables open communication. It involves letting others know how we truly feel. And it's crucial in maintaining balance in our relationships. Now, the thing about honesty is it always carries certain risks that may harm our social well-being, such as social rejection, social judgments, social isolation. And sometimes, it requires us to portray ourselves in a less than positive light. But they are the fundamental building block for a trusting and long-lasting relationship of any kind. Now we should ask ourselves, does digital technology facilitate dishonesty? And intuitively, we might think that it does because the other person or the person on the other side cannot see our eyes interpret our body language, or even hear pitch in our voices, that is to detect that we're lying. But on the other hand, everything we say now is recorded. So that involves more risks in lying, because lies can always be traced back to us. And since we're talking about lying, we should definitely watch out for these the next time we see them. We say, I'm on my way, but when we act, we're actually thinking about going on our way, we blame the batteries or phones uh, for not responding to a message promptly. And when a conversation turns unappealing, either through text messages or online conversations, um, sometimes what we do is we say, gotta go, talk to you later. <clears throat> and the reason why we do this is because we're taking advantage of the fact that the other person does not know what we're doing at the moment. Now, these are some examples of how digital technology facilitate dishonesty. But there's another example, a very interesting example that I want to show you today, and it's about online dating. So recently, a study was conducted uh, looking at profiles of men and women in online dating, and they, they're trying to, I guess, see how much people lie on these sites. They asked two questions. For men, um, they asked about their height, for women, it was about their weight. And you can see that men tend to over-report their heights and women under-report their weight. That diagonal line you see is the truth line. And as you can see, most of the dots are below the truth line for men, so they're over-reporting their height. And the dots are above the truth line for women, which means they're under-reporting their weight. So it seems like digital technology facilitate, 
dishonesty a lot, doesn't it? But there are other instances that digital technology promote honesty. And what are these? <clears throat> Online blogs and networks that provide support for gay, lesbian, or bisexual individuals who may be suppressed within their own communities. They can use digital technology to help build more accepting, understanding, and open relationships by connecting those with uh, similar interests. And some of you may be familiar with this comic, uh, this famous new comic by The New Yorker, that says, on the internet, nobody knows you're a dog. And that's true. In many respects, when we post something online, it's anonymous. But what happens if I change it to this? On Facebook, no one knows you're a dog. Is that true? Actually, there was a study that was conducted recently about this. And what they did is they took a subject. They had four friends of a subject rate the subject's personality using personality tests um, that test the big five. So I'm sure you know, all of you know it's the, um, openness, conscientiousness, extroversion, agreeableness, and neuroticism. So they had four friends of a subject rate the uh, subject's personality. Then they took strangers, strangers, and look, uh, who looked at the subject's Facebook, Facebook profile page and rate uh, their personalities based on it. And they find that the results of the personality test were identical between the strangers and the subject's friends. So in essence, this is telling us that Facebook profiles are actually a good representation of who we truly are. Okay, so that's a little bit about dishonesty, or honesty. <laughs> Let's talk about empathy. Now, why is empathy important in relationships? Empathy enables us to deeply connect with one another. It facilitates the creation of a physical and emotional bond between two individuals. Now, we have to realize that dif uh, empathy is difficult to cultivate. It requires us to take on another person's emotional load, which may negatively affect our own mood because it may use our mental resources, our valuable resources, such as time and energy, to comfort a person. And it requires the ability to maintain a delicate balance. Oh, so that's what I just said. And empathy promotes intimate friendships and enhances the quality of our relationships. Now, the social media or the habitual use of digital technology deprive us of empathy? It's a very difficult question to answer, actually. So let's look at a study that looked at the trends of empathy of people over the last 30 years. A, study, a recent study um, analyzed personality tests of over 13,000 students over 30 years. And what they found is something that is very profound and perhaps a little bit disturbing. College students are 40% less empathetic than they were in 1979. Think about this for a second. That's only 30 years ago, or a little bit more than 30 years ago. Today's students are less likely to describe themselves as soft-hearted or to have tender, concerned feelings for others. Further, they're more likely to admit that other people's misfortunes usually don't disturb them. Hmm. So I look at this and I go, that's pretty bad news. Does digital technology have anything to do with this? Can we, is, is somehow, you know, does the effect of digital technology, or does digital technology have a role in depriving us of empathy? And I think the answer is yes. Because one way to look at it is social networking provides safer and less demanding ways for dealing with another one's suffering. An example I'd like to give here today is we use a lot of these emoticons to express our empathy. Think of the most common way that an average teenager today expresses empathy. It's by using these things. But when you think about it, these things are no more harder to do than matching an emotion 
uh, correctly to a specific situation. When we're trying to comfort a friend, a physical hug trumps any emoticons or phrases that we craft on a digital, digital screen. A genuine thank you and a smile in person has far greater impact than any, any texts, any um, emoticons can deliver. So it seems like digital technology doesn't really allow us to express empathy in a, good, in, in, in a very substantial manner. But there are exceptions. Consider, for example, we have blogs and Facebook pages that connect us and evoke our empathy for people with severe illnesses and victims from violent crimes and tragedies. These cases help us cultivate empathy towards others and our knowledge of their experiences might not, have, might not have been possible without social media. And I would like to talk about one specific case today. This is the case of Heather Walker. Heather Walker um, has a newborn who suffered from anencephaly. And unfortunately, anencephaly um, is pretty much like a disease. Uh, the infant is born without the brain, without part of the brain. As the, um, as the infants delivered. And so the child died eight hours after birth. So to help with the grieving process, Heather posted pictures of her terminally ill son on Facebook. Facebook removed them and stopped all activity, activity in her account due to the graphic nature of these photographs. This generated immense displeasure in the public, which stemmed from our empathy towards Heather and her child. As a result, there was public protests, and there were thousands of comments flooded on Facebook about this incident. And what happened in the end? Facebook eventually apologized and allowed these photographs to be reposted. <clears throat> this is a case where, so through social media, Empathy is evoked from us. Empathy, in this case, drove the public to protest. Empathy had the power for actions. So I've talked about three communicative virtues today and how digital technology affects them in a good way and bad ways. And I'd like to end with some thoughts. As we all know, relationships are often complicated, they're messy, and they require great efforts to maintain. Yet, they're often what brings us the most pleasure in life. We value social media because it makes our communication more efficient, more global, and more immediately satisfying. Patience, honesty, and empathy are traditional communicative virtues that we still find invaluable in our relationships. Consciously and unconsciously, however, we place less emphasis on these virtues in our communication through the technical, uh, technological mediums. And so digital technology, whether we like it or not, is actually reshaping the way we interact with others. And a question I would like to leave with you to think about today is, is this the direction that we want to take, both for ourselves and for our future generations? Thank you. Interesting presentation. Um, <clears throat> I, was, uh, I was drawn to the question that you raised about empathy and whether or not um, the statistics showing that students today are 40% less mm -hmm. empathetic than, uh, than students back in the 70s. Mm -hmm. And as someone who was a student back in the 70s, um, I, I, I question whether or not your conclusion is um, is necessarily right. I'm not saying it's definitely wrong. Mm -hmm. But in those days, uh, we would get our news from the nightly news or a newspaper, and that was it. 
mm -hmm. no internet, no flow of data 24 hours a day. Mm -hmm. And so we were relatively disconnected from major world events like famines in developing countries, war zones, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. um, as we get more and more immersed in news, which is primarily bad news, because that's what makes news, mm -hmm. um, it seems to me that we get saturated and um, desensitized to the plight of others. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if that 40% wouldn't be even worse if it wasn't for the digital media. If the digital media, um, in terms of social networks, is not in fact um, countering to some extent a trend that's, uh, that's coming in from the news and exposure to others. I think we just see the umpteenth um, shooting, uh, disaster, mm -hmm. whatever. Mm -hmm. And I think it's that aspect, I guess that's still digital technology, mm -hmm. but I think it's that aspect that's doing the desensitizing. I, I suspect it's the Facebooks and Twitters that are actually keeping us in touch and perhaps providing a counter. Mm -hmm. I think that's the, a very good point. Trend. I think that's a very good point because um, the way they measured empathy in, in that study was they, they were just looking at personality tests and they were looking at things like, do we care if someone else is suffer? Um, how does someone else's suffering affect our own mood and that type of stuff? So the mechanisms involved in which empathy is decreased is uncertain, obviously, but I think you have a very good point. Thank you, that was, that was a fascinating presentation. I wonder uh, if it's not possible though to uh, say that social media has opened up a way uh, for revolutions to take place. I think of the Middle East as an example of how mm -hmm. the Arab Spring probably would not have been possible in the 1970s. And it's precisely because of the impact of social media that mm -hmm. we can have uh, the kind of uh, radical change that we're seeing now almost overnight. Mm -hmm. And that's a good point. I mean, when we look at it, there are obviously pros and cons with digital technology and social media. And the way I think we should perceive it is digital technology is only a tool, right? How we use it will determine whether it affects our quality of relationships and whether other things can happen at all, too. Any so, other questions? Are there other questions? We've had the recent experience in the course of hearing from two uh, prominent people in uh, philosophy and uh, transhumanism, David Pierce and James Hughes. And Many of the students had the opportunity by Skype to directly talk to these folks, so they kind of feel at this moment that they know them, but they've only gotten to know them in the last week, let us say. And it's fascinating for me, James Hughes, I think most of us would now believe at this moment as maybe the best handle on what the future is really gonna be like from a practical point of view, but he has a flaw in the social me media, which he mentions all the time, that if somebody disagrees with him politically, he defriends them on Facebook right away. He can't stand to have any friends who, dis who you know, disagree with his politics. So if they post something that's different from his politics, boom, that, that friendship is gone. So it, it's fascinating, isn't it, that, that we would think, well, you know, we're looking for the truth about the future. Who has the best clue about what the future is really going to be like? Right at the moment, we may be wrong, but we think it's James Hughes. And he has this fascinating feature of himself. He cannot stand to, 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 to see on Facebook, you know, opinions that are different from his own on uh, uh, political views. Then when, when, when you think about David Pierce, who had, had a great deal, I mean, our um, conversations with him had a lot to do about the subject you just talked about of uh, relationships. Because he's talking about moving the uh, hedonic 
set point. So there will no longer be pain, that, that there will only be varying degrees of pleasure. And so how will that work? And what do we think of that? Well, um, I, I had argued that at the age of 15, everybody would vote for that. Let's get rid of pain. Yes, that's, that's great. Let's have only pleasure. Then as life goes on, and, and, and you think more about the kinds of, of things that you've been talking about today, um, you know, empathy um, uh, and these other things, um, and relationships themselves, it's fascinating that David Pierce believes that humans are not inherently good. If we were, then a lot of this stuff wouldn't matter. We don't need the fear of painful experience to keep us in line if we're basically good, but he doesn't believe that. He believes that, that uh, human beings are basically wretched creatures and we can't be trusted worth a darn, and yet he, he thinks that in the future we will get rid of all pain and suffering and, and that the world will work better without any pain and uh, suffering. So uh, talking about defriending, I mean in the real world you could get rid of a friend and not feel any sorrow. Not, you, you, you could lie and not feel any remorse. You, 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 and um, would that really be a, a better world? But the fascinating thing about the direct interaction we're having in the course, when I give you a second-hand account, you probably think, well, David Pierce is a jerk and he's all wrong. But when he's actually in the room talking with you, he can weave a story that's quite consistent and you're almost convinced that this would work. But I, but I think the more life experience you have, the more you realize that uh, pain seems, seems to serve a purpose <laughs> in a lot of settings. So anyway, sorry, sorry about the long-winded comment. I, I think, thank you very much. And to keep us on time, I think we, we should go to the next presentation.